this is Penny Som with Raven and Broken Project, and we're here with our partner, Margaret Holzer, two-time Olympian, three-time medal winner, um, and survivor of adult, or a, no, that scratch, survivor of child sexual abuse. Um, thanks for being here, Margaret. Hi, glad to be here. <laughs> Great. Hey, so Brave and Unbroken Project is launching a campaign called Be Loud. And what that means for us is helping survivors and victims kind of move into that past the survivor mode and into the thriver mode and being able to find their voice. So loving yourself and um, owning your story, unleashing your voice and be daring, be daring in all that you do. And so I'm curious in your story, if you would like to share a little bit with us and how have you gotten to a place where, let's just start with the L, how have you gotten to love yourself? You know, it's been an, an ongoing process. I don't think that that's ever something that you fully complete, right? I think that's a continuation. I think that um, in my mind, um, and, and maybe this is, is the, the generation of watching Disney movies, um, I sort of always thought like, you know, one day you just, you get there and that's it right you know in a disney movie you never see what happens after happily ever after right like ariel gets married and the little mermaid and then that's it like right, she's right. done um and so i think i always had this illusion that like happiness love like it's it's just attained and i never recognized that it's it's not an attainment it's a constantly evolving ongoing process right you can love yourself you can be happy but you have to keep working at that. You have to keep striving. You have to, you know, it's constantly going because your life is always constantly going, right? Like, you know, you can be on top of the world and then, I don't know, somebody hits your car and, you know, or you run over a nail and you got to go buy new tires and tires are expensive, right? Like, you know what I mean? I mean, it's just like things happen. And so I think you constantly have to reinvent yourself and, and strive for that happiness and strive to love yourself. And, you know, some days are, are easier, some days are harder. Um, but I think as I've gotten older, I've, I've learned a little bit about that and that process. And as a whole, I can say that I always love myself. Um, but there are definitely days when it's like, you know, shouting from the rooftops. And there's definitely days where I'm like, you know, I have to start like search for it a little bit more. Um, but I think it's kind of getting to that point where it's at least muted and it's always there has taken some time. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a, it's a long journey. It's a lifetime journey, right? Especially Absolutely. when you've been abused and you've got to work through those little voices that creep in, um, or thoughts or theories or whatever. So really being able to embrace yourself and jump into your self really, if you would, and being who you are is really, really important. Yes. Thanks for that. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, um, owning your story. That's not always easy. Um, it's one thing to talk about it, but to own it and know that those are experiences that you're going to carry with you is not the easiest thing. And I hear survivors often say, like, I just want to put that away and, you know, put it in a box, put the lid on it. But the problem is those experiences are how we show up. It's how we show up in mm -hmm. our lives. It's how we show up at work at, with our families, with everything. So let's talk about you and how you owned your story. Um, you know, I think it's, 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 trying to think how I want to say this. Um, it's, it's like, you have to sit down with it and have a conversation with it and, and acknowledge it. Right. Because it's always in the room, you know, and you just kind of, you don't have to be friends, you know, but you just have to acknowledge its presence. It's like a ghost, <laughs> you know, I mean, you just acknowledge right. its presence and, um, and you kind of know it's there. And then I think that's, that's how you keep it from sneaking up on you and from, you know, catching you unawares and so that you're unprepared for something um yeah. i think when you try to shut it out and when you shut the door on it that's when people are fine 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 and then all of a sudden years later just something happens and the lid pops off and it's like uncontrollable True. um and i think also you don't know what to do with it in that moment versus when you kind of acknowledge it and you recognize it, you, you start learning those little bitty steps of, okay, maybe these are what my triggers are. Or this is what I like. And this is what I don't like. I mean, you start having those conversations with the people around you and it's, 
you know, it's it just, to me, that's just a conversation. It's an acknowledgement of this is, you know, like anything, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. This is what scares me. This isn't what scares me. Um, and it, you know, it's like talking about what food you like, right? Like I'm, you know, lactose intolerant or I'm gluten, you know, whatever. And it's, it's, it's just having those conversations. Um, but you do have to look internally, right? Like it's not something you just magically know. You have to kind of look internally and, and start figuring out like, okay, why am I reacting this way? Or what about what just happened that is making my heart race, right? Like I, I can feel my heart racing. What just made that happen? And start kind of looking at things and then you can kind of start to break that down. And, and is that hard? Yeah. Is it emotional? Yeah. Um, but it does get easier. And I think it ultimately makes it a little bit easier in the long run. Yeah, I agree. And I think when, you know, I've had, I talk about this often, but I had a gentleman say to me, do you want us to just talk about abuse over the oranges in the grocery store? Right. But we want to normalize, right. That's owning our story is helping the world normalize. This is happening. We need to acknowledge it. We need to talk about it. And when we can finally get there, that's when the the shift is happening, right. The, Mm -hmm. the, the times that you get to talk to groups of people who have never heard your story, like, oh my gosh, like these things happen. And I think that's where that really comes into play. Right. And I think that's the, you know, the point when you are talking about it in oranges in the grocery store, and that means it's truly not a big deal. Right. And it, it's not memorable for lack of a better word. Um, one of, one of my favorite stories as a kid was um, I asked my mom, you know, what condoms were because I truly did not know. Right. Mm-hmm. I'd heard it in school and you know, I, I, I remember the whole like situation, crystal clear, except for her answer. I have no idea what she told me. And the reason I don't remember is because it wasn't traumatic. Yeah. Right. I know my mom answered me. I know she gave me an answer that was age appropriate because for one, if she hadn't, I would have just keep needling her and I would have kept answering if she hadn't, you know, if she'd brushed it off. Right. Yeah. Cause that's the kind of kid that I was, I would have just been like, that's not a satisfactory, you know? Um, but the fact yeah. that it wasn't traumatic, she didn't yell at me. She didn't freak out. She wasn't like, why are you asking? You know, like mm-hmm. it, it was just like no big deal. And the fact that it was no big deal, it was like an every, it was no different than me asking her what an orange is or an avocado or some other, odd, you know, I mean, those are normal fruits, but you know, it could have been an, an odd fruit at the grocery store that I hadn't heard of as my point. And, and the point at which you can talk about some of these things and it's not in a traumatic way, right? right? And it is in a normalized way. Um, that is how you move on from things and in society, it, 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 you know, it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, I agree. And I think it also goes to like, my mom never wanted to talk about the S word, right? Mm-hmm. We never talked about sex. Um, my, even my cycle just showed up and no one had ever told me this was going to happen. Right. I mean, these are the things, these are the things, these are the conversations we need to be having with our kids, right? Yeah. Naming private parts, what they really are saying, what they are having full conversations around bodies and how they change and hormones and needs like that. All of that helps us also own our story. I'm laughing because as you saying that, I'm like, Oh, mine showed up in my, on the way to a swim meet with my dad in the car. And so I learned all about periods and tampons and everything from my mother while my dad's driving the minivan on the way to swim camp. And God bless my dad. He just kept driving and looking forward. He never turned around. And my mom's like in the passenger seat, you know, turning around, like telling me all about womanhood. And my dad just eyes forward. but <laughs> you know i mean he, you know it's probably the quietest my dad's ever been on like a three-hour road trip you know ever but you know i knew that i could talk to my dad if i needed to yeah. you know i mean at the point when i told my parents i was abused i did go to my mother that was my choice you know it was easier but i always knew that i could go to my dad and if for some reason my mom had not been in the picture i always knew <laughs> it would have been awkward obviously i mean i'm i'm almost a 40 year old woman and i i still don't want to talk to my dad about sex let's be honest right yeah yeah um, but i could have i absolutely could have and and he would have been there for me if i needed that yeah yeah that's great well thanks for that so the you in be loud is unleash your voice 
So yes. we know you like to talk, Margaret, you do an amazing job, but, and I'm sure in swimming, you had to like be in front of the camera. You had to answer questions from a very young age, but at what point did you flip besides telling your parents to when you got to a place where you're like, I need to tell my story. I need to unleash my voice so that other people know they're not alone. Um, so I told my parents at 11 and I pretty much didn't tell anybody till I was 25. Um, I had one or two friends that knew in like high school. Um, I had one friend in college that knew and that was it. Um, I thought about telling, um, the world in my first Olympics when I was 21 and I was like, absolutely not hell. No, not ready. Like, I, I mean, I just, I was, I it freaked me out. Absolutely not. And so 25, um, second Olympics still wasn't like in love or thrilled with the idea. And, and for me, the realization was I had kind of always thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this, you know, when I, I have this perfect life, right. I'm going to be married with 2.5 kids and this white picket fence. And, you know, and I just kind of realized like, none of that matters. I mean, I could be 95 years old and it's not going to make me want to talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like it's, it's going to be uncomfortable regardless. I'm going yeah. to be nervous. I'm going to be terrified. Like it's, it's never going to get easier. And then once I realized that I was like, well, if it's not going to get easier, I might as well just get it over with, you know, it's like taking a test right? Like, if, you know, like if I don't, if you either know the information or you don't, right? So you might as well just do it and, and just get it over with. And so once I kind of realized that I was like, well, okay, I just, I just want to be done with it. I just want to go ahead. I want to tell everybody I want to be out there. And, and that, that was kind of the mental switch for me. And I'm so glad that I did. And, and it was such a rewarding experience and yeah, at 25. So what did you do? Were you behind a camera? Like what, what was the scenario? Um, I sat down with a reporter and um, did a, just a good old fashioned, um, you know, newspaper reporter. Um, it was actually with the Associated Press. Um, <clears throat> so we sat down and did a, you know. That's a big deal, the Associated Press. We're not talking <laughs> about your hometown paper. <laughs> Well, it is and it isn't because you don't know if it's going to get picked up. Oh, that's so a good point. It can go one of two ways. It can go really, really big or it can be nowhere and nobody yeah. reads it and not, you know what I mean? And it can just yeah. be nothing. Um, so it had the potential of going one of, of two directions. And at the time when I went public in 2008, um, there were, I mean, there were very, very few people um, athlete wise, you know, or celebrity wise that had gone public. Um you know, athletes were not on the cover of, you know, Sports Illustrated when you went public yeah. at that point in time. I mean, it, it was not like a guaranteed fame thing. It was not like a, you know, people are going to like you. Um, I mean, I had a company that was interested in me in a sponsorship that after I went public was no longer interested in me because oh it was God. a controversial topic. Right. So, I mean, it was not necessarily something that was always positively viewed. Yeah. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it was, it was very different, I think, than how it is now where people are very respectful of it. And there's a lot of people that, that have done it. And, you know, I, I really, truly had no idea what the reception was going to be. And I was very lucky. It was very positive and, and it got picked up and it, it did go, you know, it was really big. Um, but I, I honestly had no idea. I was like, you know, there's a chance that it might go nowhere and no one reads it. And then I've just told this big story, <laughs> then, you know, like it's not, not, you know, who knows? Yeah. Um, so one thing that I've always, I've talked a lot about is that famous people, right. Or the gymnastics scenario as terrible as it is still have a platform, right? There's a platform for those folks to be able to tell their story. So if you were to, if you were speaking out into the audience right now, and there's a survivor listening who's not been able to speak and unleash their voice, what would you tell them? You know, I think everyone has a platform, to be honest, right? I, I don't think you have to be famous. I don't think you have to think that you have a platform, right? I think everybody has their own platform and everybody, again, I think you need to be comfortable doing it. Um, if you're not comfortable, I absolutely don't think it's something that you should do. Um, and then if you are comfortable at a later point in time, you know, it's never too late, right? I was not comfortable at 21. I was four years later at 25, right? 
So I think you have to do it in your own time, but I think that there's a place for everybody and you never know who you're going to help. Everyone's story is different. Everyone's medium is different and how they tell their story. Um, and I, I absolutely think that everybody has a place in that. And um, if the fear is that no one's going to care or that it's not going to help anybody, that's absolutely not true. There will always be people. And I say people, not a person. There will always be people that care and there will be people that, that listen and appreciate it a hundred percent. Absolutely agree with you. So thank you for that. So let's talk about the last letter of be loud and it's the D it's to be daring. It's to dare. It's to be everything you can imagine, like just throwing yourself out there. So when we think about daring in you, why don't you share with us how that, how that resonates for you? <sighs> um, I, you know, honestly, I think it's just daring to me is, is being brave and being brave is showing up and showing up can be in little ways and it can be in big ways. I think we have a tendency to think of it in the big, loud, showy ways and, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. But, but I think sometimes being brave is doing something that scares you. Right. And, and that's not, that doesn't have to be something that's showy. It doesn't have to be the big, loud, you know, thing that we all traditionally think of. Right. Um, For me, something that scares me is dating. Right. I mean, every popular TV show out there in the world, you know, glamorizes dating and, and how much everyone just seems to love it. And I just yeah, always yeah. look at it and, and I'm like, how, how, <laughs> how do these people love it for one? And, and what's wrong with me that I not only hate it, but that I'm absolutely terrified of it. Right. And so to me, just going on a date is being brave right? And, and going through that process. So I think everyone's definition of brave is and, and being daring is going to be different. For some people that will be skydiving, right? For other people, it's going to be just little everyday things that, you know, it, that's hard for them. You know, for me, standing in front of a million people competing, that's not a big deal. To me at the Olympics, I'm like, it's just another swim meet. You know, it's the same yeah. as every other swim meet I did as a kid growing up. You know, like that's that was truly my mindset. Um, for lots of people who've been on millions of dates, they're like, "What's the big deal about dating? Everyone dates." And I'm like, "Oh my god!" You know, like I mean, so again, I think it's just it's it's finding that thing that scares you and challenging yourself to do it. Awesome. Well, like we said, we're launching "Be Loud," whatever that means to you. Thank you for sharing what it means to you, Margaret and uh, for being here with us at Brave and Unbroken Project for April Child Abuse Awareness Month and Prevention Month and Sexual Assault Awareness Month and everything we can think of that needs to be out there to continue to stop it. So any closing words? Um, Let's see. I was just telling you about a favorite quote of mine that I saw recently, which was, um, what was it? Speak your truth, even if your voice shakes. And I saw that and I absolutely loved it because I think that kind of combines a little bit of what we were saying is it's, it's being brave. Right. And it's, it's, you know, the theme of the, of what we were talking about today is it's, it's speaking your truth. Absolutely. And you can do that on your phone and a voice message and deleting it. You can write it down and burn it, whatever it takes for you to be able to start that small, tiny step to help you move forward and get yourself to where you want to be. So thank you so much. Sending you all great wishes and keep watching because we have a lot more coming. Yeah. See you later.